So, ladies and gentlemen, allow me to welcome you to this uh, e-seminar of the LIDTA, organized now by the uh, uh, European Renal Best Practice Board of the LIDTA, uh, the board producing uh, position statements and commanding on guidelines. My name is Vandalis Arapidis, and I'm the chair of ERVP. And uh, I would like to welcome you once again um, on today's e-seminar. We will be commenting on a recent uh, position statement that was uh, 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 authored by both ERBP members and members of the Juricam Working Group of RADA. And I'm very happy to host here with us uh, our speaker, Professor Patrick Mark. Uh, from the uh, uh, University of Glasgow and uh, two uh, good friends uh, on behalf of the URICAM uh, board, Professor Evangelia Dunusi from the University of uh, Ioannina and on behalf of the ERBP board, uh, Dr. Socrates Dubos, uh, also a consultant uh, in ecology in the uh, University of Glasgow. So the actual document that you probably all know about uh, is the uh, document on SLT2 uh, entitled SLT2 for evidence-based cardiomyopathy protection in diabetic and non-diabetic chronic kidney disease, a comprehensive review by Juricam and ERBP uh, working groups of uh, European Renal Association. So with this short introduction, uh, we will move directly to uh, the presentation by Professor Mark, which would uh, summarize the uh, main uh, contents of this document and then we will have enough time for questions discussions and uh insights uh in this document in the sad2 area so uh patrick the floor is yours uh thank you very much for for joining in and please okay well thank you very much for having me pantelis and uh and my my co my colleagues and uh thank you for this kind opportunity so so i uh, Paddy Mark. I work in Glasgow, so I have the pleasure of uh, this updated uh, logo that my university has just produced in the last couple of days because we've been elected Scottish University of the Year. So I had to highlight this, and um, it will not be uh, unknown to that I am uh, that three of my three three Glaswegian nephrologists, and uh, but apparently three of them are also Greek. So um, it's a very much uh, this is a presentation uh, made in Glasgow but um, you know run by my Greek colleagues so thank you thank you for having us all so let's see ah here we go so here are my disclosures so um, some of them are relevant to this topic, but um, hopefully that's okay and I'd like to start by um, just highlighting how we got to this uh, this piece of work and um, First of all, this piece of work uh, was started when I first got involved in the uh, working group for Eureka um, um, with a meeting in Thessaloniki with, um, with Professor Sarapidis, which was um, extremely exciting for me. And I think, I'm not sure I had more hair and I, I've argued or aged worse because I, I look like I've changed much but older looking, um, but that was pre-pandemic. The, 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 the article really came from a sort of shared interest in uh, cardiovascular medicine relevant to people with CKD. And we all know background of, uh, you know, that cardiovascular risk is high in this group of popula this population, that we generally have recommended renal angiotensin system blockade for both renal and also cardiovascular protection in patients with CKD based on some trials carried out a long time ago. When we come to this document, um, the reason for this document is highlighted that there is a huge, you know, it's, I think in 2023, with this huge amount of evidence suddenly accumulating for SGLT2 inhibition in patients with CKD. And really what drove this was the Credence trial published in 2019 and DAPA CKD. And I'll talk a little bit about these demonstrating such you know, a great magnitude of benefit with SGLT2 inhibition in people with chronic kidney disease, both with and without diabetes. Therefore, you know, in our role in European nephrology, we were sitting with a lot of randomized controlled trial data and behind that there was society guidelines happening there was local prescribing arrangements there was ema and mhra in the uk approving these drugs for ckd 
And there was a previous consensus statement from the diabetes working group and Eureka M1 SGLT2 inhibition in people with diabetes. And that was before I got involved in things. So I on a, you know, when we were in the middle of the pandemic, I sort of said, well, maybe we should have, maybe we should have another look at this guys. Um, which I didn't realize I would get nominated to do all the work um, or sorry, not to coordinate the effort. Um, uh, and Tillis did a lot of work as well, but to coordinate this piece. And I was very conscious of within ERA and ERBP that we had to be careful that, you know, we were not, we did not have the facility at that point to write a full guideline with grade recommendations on the evidence synthesis. But equally, there was a pressing need to say something fairly comprehensive to guide the forges through this um this you know huge new exciting area of evidence so that's what we've tried to do so what we've tried to highlight in this review article and it is a review article but it's a comprehensive review with um with team allocated the, the following sections um, we wanted to highlight background the unmet need for therapy for people with CKD and, and or diabetes for both cardiovascular and renal protection. And talk through the evidence of randomized control, the end of evidence of randomized control trials. And the, the full article goes through nearly all the randomized control trials relevant to CKD, way predating um, uh, the, uh, the, the credence, you know, you've got Declare and Embereg and all these trials. There's a bit of um, quite detailed science on the potential mechanisms of action, which is, is you know, quite, quite interesting. Uh, I wanted to highlight, I, I wanted to move this a little bit into um, both commenting on efficacy, but I also wanted to look at the risk profile based on the evidence to try and provide some reassurance or, or guidance around safety and efficacy. Um, clearly, the time we were writing this article, we also knew that um, the uh, Venerinone trials were coming through, Fidelio and um, the, the Fidelity program, um, and, and Figaro, yeah. So um, so we have some comments on that, although I'm not going to discuss those today, but that may come out in the conversation because um, clearly Professor Sarapidis is off about this. There is a summary in the of the guidelines to date from various societal guidelines, you know, cardiology, ESC, ADA, uh, European Association for Study of Diabetes, the UK NICE guidelines, et cetera. So there's loads of guidelines flying around in this. We try to just give people some heads up on where, where, where they are. I took an elective decision. So I, um, I was very keen that we knew that empikidney was coming. I, you know, our site was in empikidney. We knew that the, the trial data were going to come out fairly soon. And uh, we had con contribution from uh, Professor Harrington from Oxford, who led Empikidney, who has um, ha has also had a role as an editor at the CKJ, and we were keen to get um, his insights early. So I wanted ours to be the first society of commentary to have information on Empikidney and also the updated Smart C meta analysis of all the SGLT2 trials, looking specifically at renal benefits. And I uh, and we think we've we've managed to do that as quickly as we could, and. Finally, we have some simple diagrams to guide use of SGLT2 and obliteration clinics. So there's the headline paper. I think it looks lovely. It's got both our logos on it. This is just a snapshot from NDT. Um, if you can, if you want to, I've put a QR code. So if you want to link your, uh, click, take a picture in your camera and, and, and link that to, uh, whilst you're flicking through the, or listening to the presentation, you can use the QR card code to link to the paper. But um. I think it's really nice that we we've got a, an ERA um, you know comprehensive article there. So it's a very good background. Anyone who's who's on this on this uh, webinar, I'm sure, will be highly familiar with the issue that chronic kidney disease is a global health problem, probably affecting whatever um, ten percent of the population, eight hundred fifty million people in the world. It's, it's rising. Uh, and the global burden of disease being a you know twelfth the world leading cause of death, fifth the leading cause of death, death like twenty forty. All these data, we know that diabetes is the leading cause of CKD globally. There's a large number of people globally living with diabetes, and just to pick one study, um, you know the mortality of our cardiovascular mortality for people. This was a U.S. state 
days in out to 15,000 people. It's just a cumulative risk of you know, having diabetes, increases risk of cardiovascular mortality, up six, you know, doubles it. Adding CKD probably trebles it. Both huge, you know, huge rise in risk of cardiovascular mortality and presence of diabetes and CKD. Trials have been done. So on the left, we've got Renal. On the right, we've got one of the Arbosartan trials, the Arbosartan Diabetic Metropathy Trial. And we, you know, we can see that although these drugs had Lusartan in one and Arbosartan in another, reduced risk of doubling serum creatinine or death. The hazard ratios are not very impressive. Their, their residual risk over the five years of the study is huge. Even the people on the good drugs, the, the, the angiotensin receptor blockers, you know, 40, 50% of them are dead at the end of, uh, end of the trials. The residual risk is huge in this population. So we clearly have not uh, impacted su sufficiently on cardiorenal risk in patients with CKD, particularly with these trials from people with type 2 diabetes. So to highlight where we, you know, the, where the, the data came in that informed this review, there's two big trials. You know, I, I'm not, please look at the paper. This is a, we're just, I'm presenting some slides to stimulate the discussion amongst my learning colleagues. But we have two big trials that were in CKD that informed my feeling that we needed to move a, a further um, you know, document from ERA. And one is Credence, studying people with type 2 diabetes who had um, uh, GFR 30 to 90, heavy albinuria, were already treated with RAS inhibition and were randomized to canagliflozin or placebo. You probably all know this by now, but I think it, it just bears thinking about it was whatever it was, you know, 20, 2003 or something like that. I presented the previous study. There was nothing really happened until Empereg and the, these trials. And these this was the first really specific CKD trial. And the short message is, as you will all remember now, there we go, that compared to placebo in a trial of over 4,000 people, so much bigger trial, the, the hazard ratio of 0.7, highly statistically significant with a p-value that is unrecordably low, we see a benefit with canagle flows and compared to uh, placebo on combination of the composite endpoint of doubling serum creatinine, kidney failure, or renal or cardiovascular death. So we now have one therapy which clearly demonstrates benefit for people with, with type 2 diabetes and CKD. So I thought that was impressive. Just to reiterate the other one, and then we can we can you know put, put a little bit of discussion in. So there was clearly DAPA came next, and DAPA gliflozin or, or placebo in the DAPA CKD trial, similar numbers, two thousand patients per group. These patients, um, at least about a third of them did not have diabetes. The GFR range went down to twenty five. They still had albuminuria. They were all extremely well treated with ACE and ARB therapy at baseline. Slightly different endpoint, but essentially it's GFR decline, kidney failure, or renal or cardiovascular death. And again, I'm not going to summarize all the results. I'm just going to show the headline. Result was that with an even, even lower hazard ratio, 0.61, highly statistically significant, uh, DAPACA flows and reduced the, um, the instance of primary endpoint and lots of secondary endpoints compared to um, compared to placebo. So, so far we have two clinical trials. Um, and you know, with that being published in 2020 and uh, you know in the midst of the pandemic and all this, we needed to work through through local guidelines, local prescribing committees, licensing, EMA licensing, etc. for these drugs. So there's been a lag phase between these therapies being proven to be efficacious and actually moving to our patients, despite the fact both drugs were already licensed for treatment of diabetes. And with these trials, we're clearly, and I think it'll come up in discussion, you know, how low should we initiate uh, these drugs at what GFR is too low to start these drugs? 
what about more people with non-diabetes? Do we really need to treat with an renal angiotensin system inhibitor? Clearly, no, 99% of the people were on these drugs in, on, on, on these drugs in, in these trials. And you know, what about the evidence around safety and things like that? So that was when I put pen to paper and, and asked my colleagues on ERBP and Eureka M, should we start writing something? But then actually, fortunately, um, you know, we also then had Empikidney came out, and I'm sure you'll all be familiar with Empikidney. And the great thing about Empikidney is also that if you go to the Empikidney, if you type into Google, it takes you to their website, and you can download many of their conference slides, which is, which is great, um, because it means that for preparing this talk, but also it means as you know, practicing nephrologists, we can really see all the information that the Empa study team, all, you know, many of their analysis are, are easy to see, including many conference presentations, which are not yet in, in manuscript form. So worth having a look at, having a look at that. But Empikidney, even bigger, over 6,000 patients, or approximately 6,000 patients. Um, even greater proportion of people without, uh, without diabetes. And the GFR range at entry was, I think, down to 20. So even wider range and less even, you know, and taking albuminuria down, again, smaller, but slightly uh, different uh, endpoints, primary composite endpoint of either cardiovascular, combination of cardiovascular death or kidney disease progression, which is kidney failure, dying of kidney failure, or a 40% drop of GFR. And again, it was m 10 versus uh, versus placebo. And again, you'll all be familiar, I'm sure, with the, um, with the New England Journal paper of this one. But again, it was highly statistically significant and the hazard ratio of 0 0.72. The trial was stopped early. It only ran for two and a half years on, on, for median follow-up. And there was again a benefit with empical flows compared with placebo. So again, we see now empical flows and mechanical flows and apical flows and significant benefit across the class. So this came out, but I think it's worth bearing in mind that there's not just the primary papers of these trials, but in, in uh, November, uh, aligned with ASN and AHA 2022, there was also this meta-analysis, and we've used one of the meta-analysis figures in this comprehensive review paper. So meta-analysis uh, was... Um, led by the, the EMPA kidney team, but with input from many trialists involved in the SGLT3 trials, but looked at overall the impact of diabetes on the effects of SGLT2 inhibitors on kidney outcomes. I almost think that you know, I, I was not involved in any of this. Um, uh, uh, so I, I would have left out impact of diabetes because I think it's impact of SGLT2 inhibitors on kidney outcomes. It's much easier to actually look at the, the meta-analysis and get that, but I'm, I'm sure my colleagues in Oxford would disagree with me. Um, and I was fortunate enough that I, I did get to write an editorial to go along with it, where I coined the phrase implementation, not hesitation for SDLT inhibition as foundational therapy for chronic kidney disease with my colleague, Anavid Sitar. And I want to, I think implementation, not hesitation is where we are now in nephrology with these drugs. So first figure from the comprehensive review, which we lifted from the Oxford paper with, with appropriate um, approvals. And this is an updated meta-analysis. And this is to look at uh, kidney disease progression on the left. And on the right is AKI risk. So it's looking at kidney outcomes. And essentially, what we're seeing is across all the programs that we see a fantastic, we see a highly statistically significant benefit of on kidney outcomes with their risk reduction or of 0 0.63, highly statistically significant, favoring SGLT2 inhibition across the class. And similarly or, similarly, or reassuringly, we see also a protective effect on AKI, um, which I think maybe, if you asked me eight or nine years ago, I wouldn't have thought of that. But, uh, but it turns out for meta-analysis of all the trial data, when they've looked at all the AKI events across the trials, there have been less AKI um, with the SGLT2 inhibitors compared to placebo, which I think is, is generally pretty reassuring data. 
So that's the first figure from the comprehensive review. The second figure uh, from the comprehensive review are the, the big the big ticket um, things we worry about, ketoacidosis and then amputation. And first of all, by ketoacidosis, ketoacidosis, there is a small increased risk. So yeah, I'm not, you know, there is an increased risk of ketoacidosis um, in people with diabetes. It's double that if compared to placebo. But if you look at the absolute numbers, in the people um, trial, it's like it's it's seventy, it's nearly you know seventy four thousand people, and we're seeing a total of uh, one hundred and sixty seven ketoacidosis events. So tiny numbers compared to the number of people in the trials, and it does, but it does show there's an increased risk of ketoacidosis in people with diabetes. It doesn't appear to be an issue in non diabetics. This is a there was one in empikidney, and that's it. I think um, so. Ketoacidosis, I think we can prevent some illustrative data, which informs the need appropriately for planning for starvation or sick day rules or fasting or whatever. But that's reassuring data in general, but gives some context. And then the risk of amputation. And essentially, there is no statistically significant risk of amputation in people without diabetes. And with diabetes, it does appear to be slightly higher, but that I think is primarily driven by the CANVAS trial, which seems to be a slight outlier there. So that gave us a figure, um, and perhaps a little difficult to present this on the slide on, on a slide like this, but it is really useful figure for your clinical practice because it gives you essentially the um, number of, or the proportion of events avoided or caused per thousand patient years treated. And essentially, if we look at the bottom panel, hopefully my little arrow will, if we look at our CKD patients, you know, to look at kidney, kidney disease progression or cardiovascular hospitalization, there is 11, event, 11 events avoided per hundred, sorry, per thousand patient years compared to one ketoacidosis event and one amputation event, which is again based in people with diabetes. Um, and you, you know, you, you can look at that in CKD, um, and you can de debate that at different levels of GFR, and similarly for heart failure patients. So it gives you some illustration. I would refer you to the, 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 the actual diagram to look at that. And that is again, it's open access to the Lancet, and it's also in our in our um, in our paper as well. This is the first figure we tried to produce, or don't try, we did produce from the um, from the data to try and cause a sort of guide to protocolize management. And we didn't want to be too prescriptive, but essentially some people have said to me, oh, you just give STLT2s to everyone with adverse cardiometabolic profile. We would still be enthusiasts for checking albuminuria, we still think you should at least think why you started the drugs and what the indication is. And for patients with heart failure in the pinky red color, then empagliflozin and dapagliflozin have, have had benefit in the emperor trials and, DAPA and deliver trials and, uh, and oh, it's called dapahf. Um, for CKD, it's empagliflozin from empakidney. And for CK, uh, Dapical flows and for Dap from Dapa CKD and Canna from Credence. Canna is only really for people with diabetes. Dapa and Empa slightly different initiation doses. Um, but you know, this is pretty small differences, but nonetheless, we wanted to highlight where the actual evidence is when you're phenotyping the patients rather than generically saying, oh, adverse cardiometabolic phenotype have an SGLC2. We want a little bit of precision. Um, but over, but you can see for many of these patients, there's a very large overlap across the across the class of what drugs they might want. This, um, and I have to give credit to my two Glasgow colleagues, um, Dr. McCorry and Dr. Gillis, who came up with the original idea for this figure, and then um, uh, Alberto Ortiz, who updated this. But we wanted a kind of we wanted to keep focus on nephrology and talk about glomerular disease as well and think of a kind of flow chart which might assist um, using these drugs in CKD. 
which didn't, which took the just out of the glomerular disease silo and the cardiometabolic disease silo and say, actually, you know, people in both DAPA, CKD and Emba kidney, many of these people had glomerular nephritis. You know, we've now seen subgroup analysis of this. So basically what we're trying to say here is if there's a glomerular disease that has albuminuria, that has the GFR, which is appropriately low or selected that they would have been in the trials, it is reasonable to get to give renin angiotensin system blockade plus an SGLT2 inhibitor. Clearly, there will be some people who have a primary glomerular disease, which, and, you know, the obvious one is, you know, minimal change disease, where you it may just remit with immunosuppression. And I don't think you can make a great argument. I don't think you can make an argument that these people necessarily meet the criteria for having an SGLT2 inhibitor. But for many of these people for the glomerular diseases where you may institute immunosuppression, but once the immunosuppression is completed or and they have not received, you know, gone into complete remission, then one should still be thinking of an SGLT2 inhibitor. And again, that might come up in the uh, in, in the questions, you know, what is the role of SGLT2 inhibition in glomerular disease? Should all IgA patients be on an SGLT2 inhibitor, et cetera, et cetera? So again, I refer to the figure, you, you, you know, have a have a look at it and, and, and see. But we were trying to drive people into thinking of these drugs being kidney protective drugs rather than simply diabetes drugs or heart failure drugs, reminding people that people with glomerular disease also need cardiometabolic protection. So this is my concluding slide, again, with the QR code. And the review is open access. The QR code is there. I think SGLT2 inhibitors are a novel therapy with potential to change outcomes, but only if we actually get them to our patients. I think they're generally easy to use. There are side effects. I'm not shying away from that, but they should, you know, hence need to be used appropriately. Say writing big manuscripts with lots of evidence uh, requires a team effort. And um, I, I, we first kind of conceived that, the, that something needed to be done in Paris. That's me with uh, with uh, Dr. Stompos there in the, Paris um, before the beers came out. Um, but we conceived this as an ERA initiative around then about in starting these conversations. And um, it takes a bit of time and a bit more evidence to convert that into uh, a big review article. With that, I will finish and I will stop sharing and I'll hand back to the panel. So thank you, uh, uh, my dear uh, Patrick, Professor Mark. This was an exciting overview of the content of the article and the STLT2 story, an exciting uh, story indeed. So my burning question uh, relates to the last photo. Was it like from Glasgow? Because if it was, then Glasgow looks really sunny and warm and nice. <laughs> which is, which I can is, assure you, so, so which is very, um, very, very promising. So yeah, thanks so for changing. Photo, yeah, the, the first photo was definitely from Glasgow, taken with a drone. But I can assure you today, it is freezing and it's raining. Okay. So, okay. yeah. All we right. would encourage so, people to come to Glasgow for scientific meetings, but we don't promise weather to go along with it. There's lots of lovely okay. things to see, good bars, good restaurants. Lots that, 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 that's good for science, you know, keep people in yeah. the room. So, okay. So I was going to say that uh, we have a number of burning questions coming in, but I would like to uh, give for a short uh, comment or a short overview uh, to pass uh, uh, to Professor Dunusi. Uh, just for like two or three minutes, like a general comment, and then to, to Dr. Stubos, because uh, I think I will have all of you involved in the questions that will keep on coming. So Eva, please, just, just a couple of words if you may. Eva, I think we can't hear you, you're still oh, on you're, the phone. Yeah. You're on okay. mute, Eva, I think. So, yeah. Sorry. So first of all, to say that I'm happy and honored to be a part of this uh, nice uh, company with great colleagues and uh, friends. Uh, uh, I have both characteristics. I'm Greek and I have a Glaswegian uh, uh, education uh, many, many years uh, ago. And uh, uh, thanks. Uh, I would like to thank uh, uh, Professor Mark for his excellent uh, uh, presentation. Um, with it was detailed 
and uh, uh, tried to present uh, every aspect uh, of uh, uh, HCLT2 in diabetics and non-diabetics. And uh, I don't know if everybody, uh, I mean, share the same uh, the same idea with me, but uh, I think that we are really lucky uh, living in the golden age of uh, these new therapies in our CKD patients uh, uh, regarding SGLT2 and also the new MRAs. So to go to the SGLT2, uh, we know we have seen a uh, 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 accumulating lines of evidence that these drugs uh, are above from their uh, action as a hyperglycemic uh, uh, drugs. Uh, they have shown uh, robustly their effects uh, on uh, preventing renal and cardiovascular events in diabetic patients uh, who are the um, vast majority of our CKD patients along with hypertensives and also in non-diabetic patients uh, which are hypertensive patients but also patients with primary and secondary glomerulonephritis uh, such as uh, uh, Professor Mark has said in his uh, presentation. Uh, up to now, we have guidelines uh, regarding uh, CKD patients with uh, um, EGFR above 20 or 25 uh, uh, regarding their renal uh, beneficial uh, effect. We have guidelines about uh, the cardio uh, protection uh, which starts uh, even in lower uh, albuminuria levels above normal, 30 uh, milligrams per gram. Uh, but uh, we have many, uh, I mean, we don't have um, evidence regarding patients, either diabetic or not diabetic with lower EGFR with about KTRs and also dialysis patients. And I know that these are hot questions uh, as well. So- Eva, no, sorry for interrupting, but uh, as you mentioned that, I need to drop in because we have exactly three questions about that. So just if you can just give you give your opinion about the possible use in, uh, in transplant patients? And what about uh, using dialysis patients and those with residual renal function? Do we think we will have any good news on that? What is your personal opinion on that? And I'm taking this opportunity in order to, not to go back every time uh, to okay. hear the, okay. the views okay. of the other panelists as well. So okay. what about dialysis and what about transplantation? Thank you, uh, thank you, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, there is a um, suggestion that uh, uh, although, I mean, we cannot start SGLT2 uh, when EGFR is below 20 or 25, but we are not obliged to discontinue them when the EGFR drops below these uh, levels. Uh, but uh, I mean, I'm not aware and I don't think that there are, and uh, uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, that there are big uh, uh, trials uh, supporting uh, their beneficial effect in uh, uh, dialysis uh, uh, patients. And I know that there is an ongoing uh, uh, trial uh, with uh, uh, patients with uh, a very low EGFR on, on dialysis, I think that the name is the, the NAR renal life cycle trial, but uh, I, they have not published any kind of uh, results yes, yet. I think that in these patients, we might think of a beneficial effect in cardiovascular and heart failure, maybe hospitalization, but as I, as I said, and I mean, I, I put my money on, on this, you know, uh, uh, option, but I, 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 I'm not, we don't have robust uh, evidence. 
and uh, to uh, close with the kidney transplant uh, patients. Again, we don't have randomized uh, big clinical trials uh, in a very uh, er uh, uh, early, some um, uh, months ago, two months ago, there was a, a, a review. Uh, I found uh, around 10, 10 uh, observational trials uh, with the KTRs uh, receiving SGLT2 because there were diabetes uh, before transplantation or after transplantation. And uh, uh, there is also another uh, trial, another observational uh, study, which was published in uh, CKJ two months ago with a, a um, number with around 300 of K, uh, KTRs. And uh, the uh, conclusion, I will just uh, state the conclusion of the, uh, uh, of the paper, was that uh, they are uh, beneficial in terms of controlling glycemia, weight blood, weight, blood pressure, anemia, proteinuria, and silk acid and magnesium. It seems that they have a, a, a bigger incidence of UTIs, okay, in kidney transplant recipients, especially in, uh, in women. And we have, we have to be careful about uh, this uh, issue, about UTI, about asymptomatic bacteri bacteriuria. They don't give any evidence about their patients. They include it in. And uh, I mean, uh, we need more, more trials about uh, these uh, uh, drugs in, in KTRs. And again, I think that uh, if, we, uh, if we do uh, big trials then and start putting uh, them into KTRs with caution, uh, we will have again uh, beneficial uh, effects in our KTR patients because we know that they have a very high cardiovascular burden. Okay, that's great. So to sum up, because we have more or less the answers on two different sets of questions, dialysis, it's highly possible that there is a cardiovascular benefit, but we don't know yet. We're expecting these studies. And I'm actually thinking that a lot of the studies on uh, CKD, like the EMBA kidney or the double CKD, could have some patients, uh, uh, a lot of patients reach end stage in a disease, so that there should be some kind of adequate follow-up perhaps for a based on maybe meta-analysis to tell us what's going on. So dialysis, we don't know. We just don't need to interrupt these drugs as, as, in state, as CKD progress in states. And on transplantation, there are lots of reports with numerous benefits. We don't have any trial there as well. But just to you know point out, we don't have any major trial with basis for ARBs or any other kind of, of, uh, of protective uh, therapy in transplant, apart from the upper end in your suppressed regimen. So it could be two uh, new uh, uh, subgroups of patients that we could use them. So I'm passing on to uh, Socrates, and, uh, uh, being the uh, the other ERPP board member. So probably Socrates would like to, uh, uh, to tell us what do you think about the positioning of these strikes in terms of recommendation and in terms of yes. different patient groups, uh, like after the comment. So please. Yeah. Yes, I think Evangelia and uh, yourself, then they, you covered most of that. First of all, I would also like to thank uh, Patty that uh, has has led this uh, this fantastic review, and also all the ARBP and the uh, Eureka team. So, unfortunately, I was a member of that team at that point. Yes, just to um, as I said, Evangelia has very nicely summarized the trials. Just to, to add on with regards to the, we have three major trials, uh, we including patients with CKD and proteinuria plus minus diabetes, and they have very uh, strongly demonstrated the cardiovascular and mortality benefit in patients on STLT2 inhibitors. The signal for uh, CKD patients with no proteinuria was not that strong in the uh, EMPA kidney trial. However, this may probably relate to the fact that uh, patients with no proteinuria, they progress slow in a slower rate. Uh, and uh, the total number of events in, the, in this group was was less compared to the proteinuric uh, group. So it may be that uh, if these patients were followed up for longer, we would see a benefit there. Uh, uh, just to, to mention here that both TAPA, CKD, and TEPA and were, were, were stopped prematurely just because of, of the magnitude of, of the benefit. Looking at the diabetes trials, 
Um, in patients with diabetes, patients with no albuminuria, they had cardiovascular benefit as shown in the Empareg canvas or even the declared uh, clinical trial. So it is likely that the benefit exists in uh, non-proteinuric uh, CKD. For dialysis, again, yes, there is a trial ongoing, um, but looking at the pathophysiologic mechanism of, of the SGLT2 inhibitors, uh, the way they, they improve cardiovascular uh, outcomes is by inducing nit natriuresis, and then uh, via the, the tubular glomerular feedback mechanism, they, they constrict the afferent arterial, et cetera, et cetera. And then what happens is that uh, they reduce the intraglomerular pressure so in dialysis patients that don't pass any urine, I can't see how they can get a benefit from the pathophysiology point of view, though again, it needs to be proven in clinical trials. And with regards to transplant patients, again, uh, not, not a huge amount of data, uh, but I think from the studies that have been published so far, there are two things that we know for sure. The one is that they, they don't seem to interact with uh, calcineurine inhibitors. There's no change in the trough levels in all the trials, in all the studies, most of them retrospective have been published, and they don't seem to affect the, the levels of the CANs, which is very important. And the second one is, uh, it, it looks like they have an effect in, uh, in agency, improving blood pressure. So it looks like the, the mechanism, uh, the natriuretic mechanism is, is there, despite the fact that we're talking about denervated kidney allografts. Uh, and that is very important. But I think, as your colleague said, for, for all these groups of patients, we need to wait for, for more data from the trials. Hi, thank you, Socrates. And we need probably to wait for that, but we don't know if these data will come. So probably the uh, the types of benefits are too obvious. So I'm coming back to, uh, to Patrick. And uh, uh, again, uh, we have a lot of questions. And I think, uh, you know, uh, Patrick, you can just comment on... Uh, those things we have already discussed, the recommendations, non proteinuric disease, uh, dialysis, and transplant patients. But I have a specific question that is coming back and back again. What about the use of SWDs in people with lupus nephritis, perhaps in the chronic stage, or other glomerular nephritis, uh, perhaps even vasculitis in the chronic stage, uh, other than FSGS, IGA, and some membranous nephropathy? Uh, that were included in, in the studies. So let's start from that and then you can expand. Yeah, so, so okay, I'll go specifically to the questions. I did see, I was keeping an eye on the chat, the, whether it's lupus or vasculitis. So I think, first of all, it has to be clear that patients who are on active immunosuppression, I think were definitely excluded from DAPA CKD. I, I don't have it in front of me for EMPA, but you know, they were excluded, they were on active immunosuppression, and I think maybe some people in Ember were on small doses of steroids. So it makes it very difficult to say, oh, these drugs can be recommended with the same degree of evidence in vasculitis. Nonetheless, uh, there, you know, there will be people who have had immunosuppression, but you know, do not return to normal levels of kidney function and have residual proteinuria due to secondary FSGS. And I would argue that if they've got degree of albinuria and they've got to have normal kidney function, then almost certainly we they still fit the criteria for the types of patients who went into these trials and these patients are likely to benefit. And I, I was sort of just trying to emphasize that last figure. I, th I think we sometimes forget that people with um, treated glomerular diseases which require immunosuppression still have CKD and still have albinuria and still die of cardiovascular disease often, I mean, I accept the infection. So, so I'm reasonably enthusiastic that we don't forget about those things, but we also shouldn't forget about the simple stuff like renal angiotensin system blockade and these patients as well, because we sometimes fixated on the immune suppression. So I do know that there was an enthusiasm from colleagues to try and pursue a trial of these agents in people with treated vasculitis for residual cardiovascular risk. I have no idea if it is getting funded because it's quite difficult now. The companies have funded three mega trials and then going chasing after some more niche indication becomes more and more difficult. And I think we will come to a point where we say, yeah, we're going to have to use some of the evidence and accept that's what it is. I think that's probably happened to transplant stories that there was a lot of enthusiasm for a US-based 
transplant SPLT2 trial, and, and I, in the end, I think they struggled or didn't get it funded because the degree of equipoise has kind of shifted. It's like, really, do we think these patients are going to benefit or some patients are just going to creep onto these drugs anyway and it'll become increasingly difficult to operate? So I, I think we have to be careful how we apply the evidence, but I don't think we should be, you know, didactic in how we exclude patients on the basis that they didn't quite fit the criteria of the trial because mm -hmm. otherwise we'll never move things forward. And there are a, a lot of small trials coming in and some retrospective analysis on the use of SLT2s on, you know, on lupus, uh, a yeah. few decades of patients here and there, and probably within a couple of years, we have enough, or, you know, numbers are coming up, accumulating to, to yeah. have some some reasonable uh, data on the or whatever. Yeah. Okay, so thank you. That was that was quite clear. Uh, and since the questions are keep coming, I uh, have uh, for all of you uh, a critical question that came up three times: dapagliflozine or embagliflozine? Is is there any difference? I've or... still got my mic off, so I'll just say I'm aware that I think this seminar is sponsored by a, a manufacturer of one of those drugs, but I think. As I'm far as sure. I can I'm not, I'm not sure it is, but I don't know if it is or not. But I just saw, I just thought it was a highlight here. I mean, it's clearly a class effect in the sense that the hazard ratios for all the trials are so similar, and they affect you know this benefit looks so similar that I, I find it impossible to believe it's not to some degree a class effect. I think there are differences between the trials, which are interesting. You know, as saying Emily, there's this group. We we finally find out what the she, what what the relative benefit is of people with very low albuminuria, which we didn't know from the other trials, but I, I think it's a, it's a class effect. Um, yeah, and, and I would oh. come. Can I comment maybe on that? The it's worth again digging around the slides. I, I noticed there's one of the MPA kidney investigators is in the participants list. Um, it's worth digging around to see the work of GFR slope on the people with very low level albuminuria, because my understanding and caveat that with it's my understanding is that there's benefits seen on the outcome of GFR slope with people with low level albuminuria and that's clearly because it's a you know it's, it's a numerical value rather than a hard outcome because the trial wasn't wasn't run long enough and the event rate was much lower in people with uh, low grade albuminuria but it's worth looking looking at these sorts of things as well but yeah this 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 is something that Socrates also discussed this is probably the inability of our commonly used uh, outcomes to capture what is going on in uh, people with normal albuminuria and with slow progressing uh, renal disease. So I think that the message from Embakini is quite clear, actually confirming that it can be protective. It offers, uh, you know, protection to all kinds of, uh, of groups in terms of uh, albuminuria, but of course those that are progressing. More, more, uh, more, uh, more faster. They will have uh, the largest benefit. So going uh, back again to my uh, list of questions because they keep on coming, and I'm going a bit of round. So Eva, I have a couple of questions on probable combinations of ICLT twos. For example, in Neronon, we have some data coming. What did you think about? Uh, this combination I said the two in diabetic kidney disease at this point and probably in non-diabetic kidney disease. Okay. Uh, in, uh, most of the people in uh, uh, the big uh, trials were on uh, drugs that uh, are blocking uh, the renin angiotensyl aldosterone uh, system. So we have to combine HLT2 with uh, this uh, category of uh, drugs. And of course, we know about the uh, treatment strategies we have uh, uh, in cardiology, the four pylons, which are uh, for heart failure patients, beta blockers, uh, SGLT2, uh, new MRAs, uh, uh, and also the anti-RAS uh, system uh, drugs. So we should combine uh, all of them, and it is written in their new guidelines. Uh, about heart failure uh, uh, people. And also in our CKD patients, we, we have the three pylons with, uh, again, the anti-RAS uh, and uh, SGLT2 and uh, MRAs. 
uh, because uh, uh, we have some data. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, Pantelis, you, you know better than me because uh, you are uh, deep uh, implicated in the fidelity trial and uh, this analysis that uh, there were people that were taking all these categories of, of drugs. And uh, it see, uh, it, data say that uh, all of these drugs are working together synergistically, but uh, also they have uh, a, a, an independent action, uh, both in uh, the, slow, the slower rate of deterioration of EGFR and also in albuminuria. Uh, yeah, so sure, I sure. think uh, that, uh, I mean, if there is no contraindication uh, in both uh, uh, patients with uh, uh, CKD, I mean, diabetic or, uh, okay, about uh, non-diabetic, uh, we need more, more, more evidence, okay. Uh, uh, but in heart failure patients and most of our, and diabetics, most of our patients are diabetics with CKD and cardiovascular uh, uh, high burden, we need to uh, uh, combine all these uh, three or four, four categories. It depends on the patients. And of course, we have to individualize in, in every case. So it seems we're moving in a type of heart failure treatment paradigm in CKD, and we should be kind of happy that we actually have these options because for many decades, we didn't have them. So. That's 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 good for our patients, and, and thank you for pointing this out. So coming back to Socrates, there is another very important question that uh, probably uh, we nephrologists have to uh, answer. So the question is, how can we nephrologists work to educate and empower the primary care community to take action and identify CKD earlier? And I will uh, I will add on that. Uh, we do have some data now, but with HCF2, we can actually uh, reduce the incidence of CKD, so new ones in CKD. That's a lot of, of good news also for primary care physicians. So uh, how can we nephrologists educate and uh, help people uh, in the primary care community? And is there any hope for primary prevention, through primary prevention of CKD with a specific drug class? What do you think? Yes, uh, that, that, that's a great question, especially with the, about primary care and how we can prevent or, or kind of delay uh, progression of CKD. Uh, I think, first of all, we should start by uh, uh, bringing out awareness about how we define CKD. Uh, there was a trial uh, from, uh, like there was a national survey from America that was published a couple of years ago showing that uh, Although we're quite good in checking uh, EGFR and creatinine, we're not as good in in in, in sending urine samples for urine album and creatinine ratio. Uh, and uh, if you look at this data, it looks like in diabetics only fi uh, most of them have EGFR checked, but only fifty of them have urine sent for urine album and creatinine ratio. Patients with hypertension, only about a third of them, and patients with other cardiovascular comorbidities, only five or ten percent of them. Uh, and to define CKD, we need to have the urine ACR criteria, and that's where the role of uh, the HCL2 inhibitors is as well. Uh, so there are patients with EGFR of over 60 uh, that they don't classify as CKD if they don't have proteinuria. So, and that means that they're not on, uh, on treatment with HCL2 inhibitors at, at, at that stage. So I think the one, the first step is to, to bring awareness in the community uh, about uh, how we better define. Uh, uh, find CKD and how we can uh, uh, enhance, uh, you know, the definition and how the patient should be checked for both, uh, with both bloods and urine samples. Uh, so this is the first part. And the second part is uh, uh, we need tools uh, that, uh, that can be used to uh, to monitor and to, to screen essentially a large uh, population groups. Uh, there, there are, uh, I'm aware there are some tools out there. I'm aware of a Scottish utility tool. We, ca we call that this way in Scotland. And with this, it, it can be used from the GP practices and they can identify patients with uh, comorbidities such as heart failure, uh, cardiovascular disease, AEF, uh, COPD, poten which would potentially are at increased risk of CKD. Um, in, in, uh, uh, incidents and, and progression. 
uh, it, it needs a huge effort, and I think that the earlier we, we act on uh, these patients, the better the long-term outcome, and especially now that we have another uh, medication that improves outcomes uh, in such such uh, a great degree. Okay. So just to add up to uh, what you said, because actually I'm writing a, uh, a pro-con kind of paper for, for CKZ actually right now, and we have... Uh, uh, done a, a relevant paper on primary C, uh, CKD prevention uh, with uh, Alberto Ortiz and Beatriz Fernandez. If you extrapolate data from EMBA kidney and you actually uh, have a patient starting with a GFR, say, of 80 or 85, if uh, you do everything you can without an SLD2, uh, diabetic kidney disease, they will uh, reach... Uh, uh, the average EMBA kidney uh, uh, patient on placebo, they will reach end stage kidney disease in 21 years. But if you use EMBA glucosine, they will reach uh, end stage kidney disease on 47.5 years. So this is 27 years difference just by the use of a single drug. So that's a, a long, long, long uh, uh, time in preserving kidney disease. So uh, actually, we have to look this way also now. We have to look on people uh, with uh, very early stages of disease, uh, preserved GFR, albuminuria, especially, as you said, those that are in risk of progressing uh, are faster than the others, diabetics, people with uh, heart failure, whatever. Uh, so uh, we have only three more minutes. There is another question that probably uh, Paddy, uh, who has done a lot of work on uh, this field, like to answer just looking on different sources of question. So, what about the cardio protection offered by HCLT2 inhibitors? I lectured a couple of times in the past, and I think a lot of this is relevant to uh, the kidney actions as well. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what about uh, that, Paddy? Well, uh, are there any simple mechanisms that we can look? like, you know, blood pressure reduction on weight loss or uh, improvement of uh, hemoglobin, or uh, are there any so, specific... Yeah, so, so I think um, so if you're looking for mechanisms, I can't tell you, you know, MRIs or physiological mechanisms, I think it's very difficult. We look at the trials, and, um, you know, I think most of the benefit is, first of all, it's independent of glucose, so it can't, it's not through glycemic control. I think we cannot say for definite that it doesn't at least have some relevance to blood pressure. Um, I've seen data from DAFA CKD, which I think has been presented at a meeting that uh, DAFCO flows and compared to placebo for DAFA CKD reduces blood pressure by about three millimeters of mercury systolic. So one level you say that's not huge, but remember these are people who are already fully treated and are supposed to be stable at the point they go in the trial. So you are seeing the benefit of an add-on antihypertensive. Um, and that would be at least useful. However, it requires pretty complex analysis to suggest that the, that the beneficial effect is independent of that. But I think it is likely that that is not enough to explain the benefit. Mm -hmm. Because again, we see the benefit in heart failure patients who aren't hypertensive. So we have all mm -hmm. these things. I think one thing where we compare SGLT2 to GLP1 agonist is that we don't really see it. it, it the benefit is around heart failure and CKD progression, it's not really around atherosclerotic events. We don't see a single effect, okay. but I do think it is more a heart failure, heart failure preserved ejection fraction, fluid overload, CKD progression, rather than the purely atherosclerotic mace, which I think are major atherosclerotic events, which I think is much more. So yeah. this is the, the, the modern story now. So we have this sodium sensitive obese type 2 diabetic hypertensive patient with preserved ejection fraction, and it works very well there. Uh, so very good news, but it also works quite well in people with uh, reduced ejection fraction. So yeah. there should be some additional mechanisms uh, yeah. as, as well. Is this is what you're saying. I mean, yeah, absolutely. Okay. There must be more going on than, than just simply improving cardiac function. But I don't think it's, it doesn't do everything. And that, I think that, and how we explain all these mechanisms, I mean, Socrates has already mentioned, you know, the natural basis and the glycosuria, and you know, it also reduces your rate, which is also useful and probably helpful. So, but I think there is, you know, it's it's like the classic thing is we now know that they work without knowing all the mechanisms of benefit, um, which is slightly disappointing. But we shouldn't shouldn't 
stare too much at, at, at that as a as a problem that we don't understand everything. So we should have you know leave some room for uh, future research as well. So I need to say that I'm really really happy that we talked about these very very interesting uh, topics, and I'm really not happy because we uh, our our time is up. So we are uh, like you know. Uh, one minute after our scheduled time. So with this, I would like to thank you all for uh, joining in and thank to our speaker and panelists for the uh, wonderful, uh, providing the wonderful insight on this very, very hot topic. Uh, I'm, uh, um, I'm uh, inviting you, to you, you all to the next uh, 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 era in seminars. There will be some ERBP e-seminars relevant to the documents that we have published this year, and there are uh, quite a few, and I have a, a couple in waiting until the uh, end of this, uh, this year.